it's the first day of march 2023 thursday will be the second day of march friday will be the third day of march and march 3rd is world wildlife day it's a un international day to celebrate all the world's wild animals and plants and the contribution that they make to our lives and the health of the planet this date was chosen because it's the birthday of CITES. CITES is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. Okay, it starts with the other way. Wild Fauna and Flora. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. We have a guest in the studio to come and talk to us about what we should expect to see this Friday, the 3rd of March. Her name is Edith Kabesime. She's a wildlife campaign manager at Wild Wild Animal Protection. Good morning, Edith. Good morning, Eric. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you. That is called the hot seat of the Situation Room. <laughs> Let's see how hot it gets. Uh, very good. Yeah. We start by warming it up with a proverb by Siti Muga. Guess which country this proverb is from? Maybe in Nigeria. Okay. <laughs> Second guess. <laughs> you looked at Ndu and you thought Nigeria. Maybe Ghana. <laughs> Ghana. Who did you look at to think of Ghana? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just... Third guess, final. Uh, let me see. I was not good at guesswork in school. What mm. were you good at? I always I was, I was good at getting things right. Okay, let okay. me ask you no. a simple question. <laughs> Which country do you come from? Of course, the land of milk, Uganda. Okay. Mm -hmm. City. See? So, where do you think this proverb comes from? Maybe from northern Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically. <laughs> Which country? Northern Uganda. Yeah, no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Our problems for the whole of this week come from the country of Uganda. You see? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you had no idea up until this point. <laughs> but we still see. Yeah. <laughs> you are ripped off in the market, but you are arguing about it on the road and carrying on. Yeah. Seven specifically from my village. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Which village is this? I, know, I think that let's not go that way. <laughs> no, I don't want to know. But you recognize the proverb? Hmm? Yes, I recognize the proverb. Okay. proverb. Uh -huh. Yeah, said, you're cheated said, in the market and then you quarrel all the way home. Said, yeah. it's, it's said in your dialect. Can you say My it? My dialect? Me? Can you say uh, it? Was said, Wakatari, Watongan, some hand. Say again. What language is that? Guess. Ah. <laughs> ah. Tit for tat, man. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> how many, how many <laughs> communities do I know in from Uganda? Yeah, guess. If it's Uganda, we have more than could it be Buganda? Languages? Buganda. You won't guess. It cannot be. It, it cannot be. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So do you guess? I would guess if you weren't here. <laughs> but since you're here, Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> that is from Western Uganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. I was going to say Western. Of course you were. <laughs> no, no, I, on a serious note. I know. I was thinking Western. Western. There is no tribe called Western Uganda. <laughs> no, it isn't. But we know the tribes that are in Western part of Uganda. <laughs> so it say was one. one. See the tribes in Western Uganda. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It was one tribe. The Ankole. Ankole, Chiga, yes. uh, Batoro, mm -hmm. Banyoro. Okay. Yes. Yeah. If you've read about the Bunyoro Chitara, all mm -hmm. those tribes mm -hmm. from Western Uganda. Nah, this <laughs> proverb is but a, even in Buganda, that, this proverb, that is a proverb, proverb is there as well. You've decided. It's a Batoro proverb. Am I right? Not really. Ah. It's basically... <laughs> It's a local. It's a local. It's, it's basically a, lo a Ugandan. It's a, yeah, it's a Ugandan. Many, many. I would say many, many cultures in Uganda have that have proverb. that one. Yeah. Welcome, Edith. Thank you. It's Very good to have you here. Good Tell good. us about wild animal protection. Yeah. So thank you so much, and of course I'm happy to be here. Good morning, <laughs> listeners. Uh, about wild animal protection. Wild animal protection is um, uh, a global voice for animals and i'm one of those global voices we are an international organization uh as old as uh, more than half a decade so you can imagine we've been around for close to 70 years half a century half a more than half a century mm -hmm. almost 70 years and uh, really our job is uh, speaking for animals because they don't speak like us defending their welfare defending their rights defending their well-being 
We operate in more than 50 countries globally, although we are based in around 14 countries from where we run around and do these noble calls of protecting animals. We work with communities, we work with the private sector, we work with government, uh, really in different ways. And really what we bring on the table is this interesting subject, animal welfare which sometimes sounds strange to many communities, to many societies, but because animals are just sentient like us, uh, we believe it's our role as humans to really bring these subjects on the global agenda and put animal rights, animal welfare, uh, left, right and center on the global development agenda because when we protect animals, we protect ourselves. Indeed. We protect the, the planet. Mm. That is who we are, what we do. Really, our mission is um, to move the world, uh, move people, you and me, as I mentioned, communities, mm. uh, NGOs, governments, bilateral organizations, so that we really push for this, so that animals become part of the things that we consider very vital for our own yeah. well-being. I think a crucial, though basic question is why? Um, you know, a lot of questions that come out. So whereas the understanding that animals then need to be protected on Earth is why? They're just the animals. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, Animals are facing what I would call an existential crisis. And if you look at Africa, for instance, both animals that we depend on, uh, for instance, animals in farming, mm -hmm. uh, the animals in the wild, uh, which of course Africa is very, no, very well known for, I would say they are facing an existential crisis. They mm -hmm. are suffering. Why? Because of the human the human action, the way we use them, the way we exploit them. Africa, if we go many, many centuries back, not even many centuries back, a few decades ago, as maybe as, as many as three decades, decades, we have lost a lot of our, our life. Mm. <coughs> if we talk about, say, for instance, elephants, we are saying we have lost almost 90% of our elephant populations. Lions have lost close 90% of their original range in Africa. If a handful of these uh, countries still mm. have a few elephants, a few lions, a few, all these other species. Yeah. And then billions of farmed animals are also being exploited because we need them for food. But of course, the way we, uh, we manage them, the way we raise them to get that food, mm. to meet our, uh, our food needs, uh, puts all these animals at risk. And many men are raised in captivity. Uh, we are talking about farm, farm animals being raised in cages, uh, wildlife being kept in uh, captivity for humans' entertainment, to be exploited for medicine, to be exploited in millions for pets. And all these things are putting animals at risk. And, and many, many animals are suffering. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason... Uh, World Animal Protection and of course several other animal welfare organizations come in and say we need to protect these animals because they are sentient beings. Sure. Just like us. They have feelings, they have emotions, they have communities, they have their own communities in which they live. They have emotions. When they lose their friends, they mm. suffer just like us. Mm. Yeah. So we it's about being compassionate for these animals. But also we know that Animals are part of the entire ecosystem in which we live. We are all interconnected as beings. So when animals suffer, ultimately we also suffer. And for example, uh, say COVID-19 was one of the vivid and very evident examples that uh, if we don't look after our animals well, then we put ourselves at the risk of also suffering mm. because we all know that COVID is claimed to have come from from animals because when we encroach on uh, wild habitats we break the barriers between people and animals and animals have their own diseases we have our own diseases and when we break that barrier because of the way we interact with animals then we get closer to some of those situations and that's why you see 
many, many uh, zoonotic diseases or animal-related diseases are now impacting on humans as well. So the question, why do we need to protect these animals? It is for their own sake in the first instance, because in their own right, they have a right to live, they have a right to uh, be comfortable, they have a right to have access to food, all those things, all those freedoms that we enjoy, animals need to enjoy them, and that's why we protect them. When you but say also, like if we move to the other level of um, humans, as I said, when we protect animals, we protect our own welfare. And I've used the example of COVID-19. Mm. Yeah. Edith, when you say rights, you know, humans have globally accepted the term human rights. I mean, rights. Yes. And we talk about that and we even go ahead to define human rights and we even put it in our constitution in bills of rights and we sign international conventions specific for rights. Yes. That then will give rise to the welfare and the protection of humans. Is there any globally recognized framework called animal rights? Um, there is, there is no written, what I would call written, globally recognized framework that I would call rights, but there's what we call freedoms, animal freedoms. And this is universally recognized, these are universally recognized even at the UN level. Animals have rights, which I, I would call their equivalents. I mean, freedoms, which are the equivalents of human rights. Okay. For instance, <coughs> animals have freedom to have food, to be free from hunger. That's an animal freedom, which mm -hmm. is equivalent to the human right food, for instance. Animals have a freedom uh, free, to be free from suffering be free from injury, be free from disease, uh, to be free from um, uh, cruel treatment mm. and to be, f to be able to experience their normal behavior. Uh, like animals in the wild, they are supposed to be free to enjoy the life in the wild, not in captivity. Just like human beings have a right not to be incarcerated in prisons and the abducted and all that. So those are equivalents. But of course, increasingly, the concept of rights is emerging for animals. Mm. Because we are saying if animals are sentient beings just like human beings, then they should also have rights. We should use the same language, not simply freedoms, but also rights. And increasingly, as word animal protection, we are actually shifting from animal welfare mm. to even talking about animal rights. Because not many, many years ago, when even freedoms were not recognized as, as those that are, I mean, animals as having freedoms. Mm. But we need to move a step further and say, just like human beings, we need freedoms for animals. And these are the things we are pushing for, even at that highest level of policy. Uh, especially at the UN level. Mm. Mm. Yeah. How likely are those going to clash with the human rights and our freedoms to live? If we say animals have a right to life, that removes food from our table. Yeah. When we talk about human rights, I mean the clash, it's, um, it's, we are talking about a delic really delicate balance. Uh, from an animal welfare perspective and from the wildlife perspective, you know we exploit animals for various purposes. We kill them, sport hunting is one of the ways we do. Some of those uses are really are needless, are needless. Mm. Just shooting animals for pleasure. I think that is needless. Uh, incarcerating animals in cages because you want to have them as companions and look at them mm. like African grey parrots. Millions of them are incarcerated in cages. Yeah. Mm. We think that is a needless purpose. Mm. There are other animals like dogs and cats which have been domesticated over centuries, many, many centuries, and they have been bred and managed in ways that they are compatible with human life human mm. beings so we need to look at those ways that we can live in harmony with animals without exploiting them then when it comes to livelihoods because i know maybe that's the question you are trying to say how do we balance for instance food security vis-a-vis -vis animal, right to, animal ra right to life 
we are saying even when we are consuming these animals let's do it humanely vets have taught us for instance how to slaughter cows vets have taught us how to treat goats in ways that do not even when you're killing a rabbit kill it properly don't hit it on the head with a club and reduce the suffering because we are talking about animal suffering okay reduce so, the suffering <clears throat> so how do you do this so that it's a little bit better and this animal is going to die anyway <laughs> sorry how, how do you do this so that it's better if the animal is going to die anyway i mean here we're gonna and you're the one who's decided and you, are you today is the last day, day as an animal so how do i make this better for you when you will not live anyway tomorrow? actually <laughs> taking actually, away your right to be alive actually as wild animal protection we are even moving in the direction of asking people eat less meat and even even eat le don't eat meat you get it mm. then that would mean that you don't even need to kill an animal for meat <laughs> if our campaign is don't eat less meat eat less or meat. don't eat meat mm -hmm. of course in africa people will say but uh we need meat as a source of proteins and all that so you're thinking about it yeah if one were to take your argument to its logical conclusions then we'd have to include living organisms mm -hmm. exactly plants are living organisms exactly there are botanists who will claim that plants feel pain plants mm, yeah. moan mm. yeah plants also live in communities yeah and it's not something it's, it's not a far-fetched idea if yeah. you yeah. look at uh matt geo which i am an avid fan of mm. yeah and you look at the stories that are told about ecosystems and how plants yes. thrive in certain yes. situations yes. yes what we're saying is also true of plants yes so the issue here is coexistence and a balance because these are the animals that we're talking about they also eat other animals mm. they also eat plants yeah. so there's a process in this planet that we cannot run away from mm. it's yeah. how we live how we propagate how we get on with whatever business we have but yeah. also how we live with the other species that also exist on our planet yeah. I, I think those are the two points i was talking about there is the whole idea of eat less meat yeah because we know in the whole process of eating meat a lot of animal suffering takes place cruelty takes a lot of place mm. you need to be in my country and see how we carry pigs how we carry chicken how we carry uh, we carry goats. Ca go goats and mm. cows goat cows with legs out in the hanging and all that mm. so because our governance systems are bad and are poor and nobody is enforcing that so all that suffering is taking place and we are saying can we stop that mm. If we eat less meat, if we don't eat the meat, then it means that suffering won't happen. But also I said, we need to find less cruel ways. If we must eat meat, can we have pro proper slaughter procedures? Mm. Can we have proper way of carrying the chicken? Proper way of keeping the animals in the wild? For instance, people will say, usually we say trophy hunting is a... Uh, Trophy hunting is cruel. And of course, that is the stand at wild animal protection. Trophy hunting is cruel because mm. it takes out, uh, it takes an animal out of action. Yep. Basically, it takes a life. So are you saying that we ought to and feel the same way? So, because when I see an animal that has been hunted, trophy hunting, I feel bad. Yes. But I don't feel bad when there's chicken that has been slaughtered you should feel the so same. you're saying we should actually feel the same you should feel when the i see same. that when you i see that lion same. that has been you know taken Kids. out by this guy i'm like what's wrong with this person yeah you're saying that we should actually say when chicken is being slaughtered or when we're going to have you know goats <laughs> for christmas we should actually feel i should feel the same angst that i do yes, you should feel the same. when i see the, th yes, the thing should feel the same should feel the same i'll tell you that um as early as 1998, I had not even gone into this business of animal welfare. Mm. I've been in this animal welfare work <coughs> uh, maybe for the last seven years. Mm -hmm. But of course, I was in the, in the wildlife conservation, environmental conservation, natural resource conservation area. And I was working in this location where they have lots of cattle and every day watching this cattle being carried on trucks was mm. a daily it was a daily thing 
and it's like i developed lack of I, lack of appetite for yes. meat for beef mm. just because of seeing how those animals were being treated i up to now i look every time i see beef you remember those images what you saw. those images come mm. because this was a daily experience that i lived so to answer your question mm. uh it's the same feeling you should have yeah. when you see a lion uh being incarcerated yes. in a cage you should have the same feeling when you see a chicken being incarcerated in the middle of the sun in a market in your local mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. should have the same feeling you've seen those chicken being incarcerated in tiny cages mm -hmm. waiting yeah. for a, a buyer yeah no food no water they are just mm -hmm. in the middle of the sun no shelter mm -hmm. you should have the same feeling that's my my answer but maybe going back to why we are here the world wildlife day yeah mm. sure so yeah <laughs> even as you even yeah. as you talk about so i think these are all feeding into yes. you know this this conversation as you talk yeah. about it so i mean even as you know world animal protection one of the things that you've been you know uh, concerned about is the chinese medicine trade right yeah why and what is the hope that it'll reduce or not exist completely <laughs> yeah it's, uh, thank you for that question uh you know when we go back into history uh both in asia and in africa mm. traditionally we've used either plants or animals for to treat different ailments mm. some of the treatments have scientific the scientific evidence that actually maybe a leg of a lion treats such and such a disease all there's no scientific evidence at all <laughs> so majority of the especially in asia mm -hmm. and in africa they widespread there are widespread beliefs mm. Uh, that, for instance, if you drink soup of a lion, or you wear the claw of a lion, or the teeth of a lion, then you'll be like a lion. <laughs> if you eat food laced with lion bones, you'll be like a lion. Mm. Those beliefs. So, Asian traditional medicine is one of the drivers and specifically Chinese traditional medicine, is one of the main drivers of animal exploitation, mm. especially in Africa and Asia. Uh, in Asia, certainly the numbers, for instance, for tigers, have almost dwindled just because the tigers have been uh, over-harvested and over-used mm. to provide bones, which bones are used in wine and all sorts of other uh, treatments for different diseases mm -hmm. purportedly so now the demand has now shifted i mean the yeah to, to, to africa mm -hmm. and what are we seeing lions are now the tigers the bone the lion bones have replaced the tiger bones mm -hmm to be used in Chinese traditional medicine, Asian traditional medicine, especially in China, Vietnam, Hong Kong, mm. and uh, Laos, and several other Asian countries. Uh, in Africa, for instance, South Africa is one of the big, uh, big suppliers of lion bones, which are used in Chinese African, I mean Chinese traditional medicine. Mm. Uh, many many lions are being bred in captivity in south africa you go to south africa you find a lion farm yes lion farms being in in small enclosures bare ground very emaciated lions just because they are being bred to be their bones to be exported for chinese traditional medicine wow. okay. and if you look at the suffering these animals go through uh you can't believe so then you come to leopards leopards are also being poached and their bones of course mixed with the lion bones again exported for asian traditional medicine mm. uh 
there is now almost widespread poaching of lions on the African continent. In my own country, lions are increasingly getting poached. Namibia, Botswana, wherever, all those lion range countries. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happens in Kenya. But because of that huge demand for Asian traditional medicine where lion bones and other lion parts are used in traditional Chinese medicine, then, of course, the rhino was the first culprit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have almost wiped out our rhinos because okay. of the rhino horn. Mm. So all those beliefs around the rhino horn are almost the same beliefs that are driving uh, demand for other uh, parts for other animals like mm. the lions and others we've heard of the elephants elephants you can imagine killing a whole elephant just because you want its private it's part mm. right. just why it's penis and that's it mm. and then the rest is the rest you don't care for you don't care what happens kill a lion get the claws get the teeth and then you throw it away uh certainly Lions are much more, they are worth, much more worth alive than dead, mm. if you come to think about it. The same thing with elephants, same thing with rhinos, same thing with uh, uh, leopards and mm. all the others. The pangolins, yeah. another example, mm. because the pangolin now is the, is the new rhino. It's the most trafficked animal it's, on yes, earth it's right the most, now, Yes, it? right yeah. now, it's the most trafficked mammal yeah. uh, on earth. Why still of those beliefs? Same, same. It's same, same, of the same, same, same. And we don't have scientific, we don't seem to have credible scientific evidence mm. which pins all those uh, claims that these animal parts mm. treat some of these elements. Sure. But there's something that can be done, of course, about it. Let's take a break. Yes. When you come back, you tell us what can be done about it, what states are doing about it, what communities that live with animals are doing about this 24 minutes to 10 our conversation is with edith kabesime she is from the world animal protection she's a wildlife campaign manager we are having this conversation today ahead of world wildlife day which happens on the third of march third of march this year is this coming friday keep it here for that this is the situation room the only way to start your day edith kabesime from the wild animal protection edith before you took the break you were just about to tell us what can be done so in this campaign that you have uh, launched and that you're running on the against the traditional chinese medicine yeah uh thank you eric uh first of all we need to look at um two two things mm. we have the demand side of this whole business and we have the supply side of this. So we need to have solutions that address those two sides, mm. the demand and the supply side. Mm. On the demand side, which is, of course, the Asian countries, which are the main consumers, importers of wildlife parts and derivatives and live animals, especially out of Africa, we need to engage with those uh, authorities, with governments, mm and really push for policies that are protective of wildlife. Uh, for instance, uh, in China, I remember at the advent, at the, in, at the peak of COVID-19, uh, China, for instance, came up with a policy to ban the use of pangolin scales mm. and, of course, pangolin derivatives in their traditional medicine. So basically, the pangolin was removed from what we call uh, the Chinese pharmacopoeia. Pharmacopoeia is the sort of a record or the book, or we'll call it an encyclopedia of medicine mm. in China. So in 2020, uh, after a lot of pressure, China removed uh, the pangolin scales from the, what, the pharmacopoeia. Mm -hmm. So meaning that um, traditional medicine practitioners can no longer prescribe uh, to their patients medicines containing uh, the, the pangolins. Uh, the same thing with the rhino. I remember one time actually China had opened up again for rhino trade and then we, we came up and we really made a lot of noise globally and again China closed. So those are some of the things that the highest level of policy in governments that by governments that we can do especially on the demand side mm. but also on the demand side we can engage with um, 
the practitioners themselves. And right now, World Animal Protection is working with um, a host of scientists, uh, Chinese traditional medicine practitioners. Uh, we are sort of creating a society that is moving really towards moving away from using derivatives and animal parts as part of traditional Asian medicine. Uh, we've created a website which provides alternatives that these practitioners can use. What kind of, of alternatives would Of course, be? I know my colleague is about to say which alternatives, yeah. the plant alternatives. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have come up with a website whereby the practitioners can go in and look at, instead of animal, of uh, lion claw, you can actually use maybe osmum leaves to treat this ailment so that these practitioners are provided with alternatives. Because we are not telling people don't do this, don't touch, but we are saying let's look for more humane alternatives. Uh, then, of course, on the supply side, which of course uh, the African countries, mm. we are also engaging with um, governments that are mainly the suppliers. And in this case, our friends, as I said, <laughs> Uh, South Africa is the biggest supplier mm. of uh, animal parts when it comes to Africa, I mean Asian traditional medicine. So this is allowed officially? Yes, it's allowed officially in uh, that China. That people can actually cage lions, Yes, breed it's, lions it's legal. for sale. It's right now legal mm. Mm. Uh, in South Africa. And even at the highest level of legislation, that is at CITES level, yep. uh, Africa is the only country that is allowed to trade in lion bones and other derivatives okay. or parts. So, so do they have then a period where everybody's supposed to stop? Because I, I think of Japan and like uh, tuna fishing or, 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 whaling. or whaling, whereby you can do it for a particular time and then after there's a certain... There's a season. There's a season for it. Mm. And if you're caught during that season, then you are, uh, you're, you know, you can be prosecuted. Is there something like that? Whereby you now give the species time to, <laughs> to breed. To repopulate. Yeah, to repopulate. <laughs> no, in, in South Africa, this is how it's done. Mm. The lions are bred in captivity. You find somebody with 10 lions, a small room like this, and is breeding it's those lions. It's basically zero grazing for it's lions. It's basically zero grazing lions. Like you would zero graze your cows. Instead of, of napier grass, you feed them with goats. Yeah, goats and all other things. Right. So they, uh, but then they have what they call an export quota. So for instance, in 2017, 2018, uh, the annual export quota for lion bones or skeletons that were supposed to be exported mm. legally. Mm. I think was one, th no, 800 skeletons, 800 lions. Because if we are talking about 800 skeletons, then you've killed 800 lions. Mm -hmm. In 2018, 19, they increased that quota to 1,500 skeletons. But of course, our research showed that actually, even when the official export quota is, say, 800 or 1,500, still there is a lot of legality that takes place. Mm. And even when you check the CITES database, you find conflicting figures. What is exported by the importers, I mean, by what is reported by exporters, by exporter and, what and what is reported by, import. by importers. So you find a lot of... And then, of course, you get all these incidents where you find so many kilograms or tons of lion bones have been seized somewhere. So the whole business is sort of uh, frau is fraudulent. Mm. And so what we are doing in South Africa, we've been since 2017, 18, we've been working with a number of organizations in South Africa to push for policy reforms uh, to close down the captive lion breeding industry. As we speak, uh, close to 12,000 lions are currently stuck in captive facilities in South Africa. Because in 2019, there was a court ruling that actually overturned a decision by government to keep exporting uh, lion bones. Uh, one of the NGOs, which is the National Council for the Protection of Animals in South Africa, lodged a case against government and the High Court ruled in favor of the animal welfare organizations. So up to now, 
South Africa is not exporting lions. Mm. So meaning, so many lions are still not languishing in captivity. Are still. And maybe perhaps even they are being converted into stockpiles. Mm. Right now, they are lion bone stockpiles in South Africa. But uh, the good news is that in 2021, after a lot of pressure from inside South Africa, organizations like us and globally, then uh, the government announced specifically in May 2021, that they will work towards phasing out the captive land breeding industry because it was tarnishing the country's reputation. As you know, South Africa is one of those big boys on the block mm. when it comes to wildlife conservation. And this whole issue of simply keeping lions in bad conditions, making them suffer just to supply bones to, for Asian medicine was not... Uh, doing them any good. Let me ask the question, because yeah. if you're talking of breeding, I'm looking and thinking of ranches. I'm thinking of how cows are bred. Yes. Now, are we then saying that if the lions were bred in humane conditions, then the exportation of their bones would be more acceptable? I, I, th I don't think so, because it would, it would come still to the whole issue, is this, need is this needed? As I said, first of all, utilization of the bones that does not have any scientific evidence that they chew up. They make you more of a man if you drink lion bone, so or wine, wine made of lion bones, or laced with lion bones. Sorry. There's no that scientific evidence. So it's, the whole practice is needless. Whether the lions are kept farmed for, for meat or whatever, for those purposes, mm -hmm. it's needless because... It's, so now, the, it's a combination of things. It's a needless practice. Besides that, the lions are suffering. Essentially, Just because the mm. regulation, there's nobody regulating that industry. So it means Just that the, mm. their freedoms are being infringed upon. Exactly. Exactly. You know, the, this discussion, how widespread and how proliferated is this discussion? Because I'm listening to you and what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But those having this discussion and how it is proliferated, because for something to take place and for the actions that your organization and others put across, for it to be effective, there is a, a certain volume yeah. of participation that is necessary for people to for, for, for it to actually take effect, for people to take notice and say, you know, we need to think twice about this. Eric mentioned whaling. Yeah. There are people who are in your line of business but they deal with sea animals. Okay? Yeah. And some of them are very good at making a lot of very, very serious noise. In the world of research, there are those who've made similar noises with regards to animals being used for research purposes. So those who speak loudly get their voices heard. True. And people take action. And then you have support. But in the absence of the knowledge that we're now talking about, which you're making some of us even more aware of, if it isn't proliferated adequately, then your power is, in the same manner, reduced. You're absolutely correct. Because as I said, as we're introducing, we said we are the voice for the animals. Mm. And our mission is to move the world. How do we move them? It's me and you. And in being spaces like this, mm. where we are talking to millions of Kenyans, hopefully they are listening to us this morning. Uh, as I said, the reason, for instance, South Africa made that deliberate move, finally, to close down the captive land breeding industry, of course a process which has not yet been implemented, it was because of that noise. A lot of writing, if you search on captive land breeding industry on the internet, you'll see so much information mm -hmm. that is out there that uh, finally pushed this country into the corner and said, we think this is not good for our reputation. Mm -hmm. We are a conservation leader on this continent and we cannot accept this continuous negative publicity. And of course, as you're saying, animal welfare is a new concept, uh, I think, in many of our societies. And I agree with you that we still need to make a lot of, a lot of, a lot of effort 
uh, to spread this this gospel the whole purpose we always approach especially the media and the media is actually part of our really main target in uganda we work a lot with the media in south africa a lot with the media uh, and of course here in kenya we do the same we've done a lot of training for media people to continuously uh, report on, on animal welfare mm. infringements and all these issues but going back to how what can we do about uh, this whole industry and i was still talking about on the supply side mm. what can we do again it's about engaging the governments at the policy level but also it's about raising awareness an example of south africa is engagement through the policy route but there's also the people power route yep. which is exactly talking about how do we get more people on board to ensure that this noise becomes more positive noise not negative noise becomes more and more um, in kenya for instance we engage a lot with young people because first of all young people uh, constitute the majority of our population in africa mm -hmm. and we have we, we really leverage on the young people so we work a lot with the universities in nairobi the university of nairobi and all the other universities around uh, so that we take this message out. Mm. A few years ago, just before the outbreak of COVID-19, we used to have a lot of street, wa street walks here in the, in the heart of Nairobi with me at the forefront of these young people, mm. just to raise awareness that we need to protect our, our animals. Not for the sake of animals being uh, our livelihood, but because they also have... They also have freedoms. a right. They have a right to life. But they're also part of our heritage. Exactly. You see, you see the what is this continent known for? Apart from its dark pigmented individuals. Yeah. We it's our the diversity of our animal kingdom. Yes. Yes. True. I mean, if you talk about Africa, go anywhere outside the African continent. If you talk about Africa. You're talking about the wildlife yeah. heritage. If you talk about Kenya, what are we talking about? The big five. Mm. That's what we are talking about. Now we've come up even with the little five, the little known, mm. which I also, that concept is also increasingly coming up. So we are known for that. And if we come back to Kenya, what can we do? Of course, Kenya is one of the countries on the, this continent, which I would say has done a lot, is progressive in terms of protecting our wildlife. Mm. We are known for that. Mm. But of course, that does not mean that uh, we are hundred percent there. Far from it. We are far right. from it mm -hmm. because there's a lot there. Of course, we have good laws, good legislation, good policies, but I think we are far from it. Uh, and the models like conservancies, they are good for protecting animals, but are they protecting people? That's another debate. So yeah. World Wildlife Day then comes up on Friday. The world then remembers. You know, what exactly is being done? on this day for folks to now you know come into the realization of some of these things that we've been talking about over the last one hour yeah so yeah t is it tomorrow no it's friday, friday. friday. today is wednesday so yeah. friday yeah so friday third as you said is uh, world wildlife day and as wadam protection of course we want to use that occasion to raise awareness uh so that people can really begin to realize or continue to realize that we need to protect our life uh, both from a conservation perspective but also from a welfare perspective uh, so we'll be having um, uh, an event uh, in collaboration with the kenya and uh, it's called kenya national culture center what we traditionally call the national theater and we will be having a public event where we'll be having these artists uh, really to promote uh, awareness raising through uh, spoken word, poetry, uh, drama, uh, singing, all those things that really can communicate to the public. So we have invited the public, we have invited young people, we'll be, we, are, we'll, we have invited some government officials, uh, some NGOs, as really an event where we would like to put out the messages. As you rightly said, we need to speak more about these issues. So this day gives us that opportunity to do that. Uh, of course, globally, different uh, stakeholders will be celebrating this day differently. Like in my country where I come from, Uganda, 
we really take it very, very, very seriously. And this year, the event will be celebrated in the eastern part of the country, uh, where even His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, is going to be uh, the chief guest mm -hmm. at that function. So that's how serious it is going to get. Here in Kenya, of course, the event will also take place, I think, in Nakuro somewhere. Mm -hmm. And again, it's about raising awareness. So you can see we are in different places, raising awareness, mm. telling the public. But of course, for us as wildlife protection, really the issue is animals are suffering and we need to alleviate that suffering. Uh, much as this day was set aside by the United Nations in recognition on the day when the CITES was born, mm. for us we have our own question marks mm. on the CITES because we think the CITES is the highest level. Is, I mean, wildlife trade and wildlife exploitation has been entrenched mm. at the highest level of policy at CITES. by CITES. Yes because it recognizes and promotes mm. in many ways uh, exploitation of wildlife. And we do not have the mechanisms to really govern wildlife trade as it has been observed mm. in many countries, mm. where even where the legal, legal trade at the end of the day is marred by illegal mm. trade. Yeah. yeah. Edith, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for this conversation. And as you gear up to celebrating and marking World Wildlife Day on Friday, we wish you all the best. And yes, of course, we'll be here supporting you.